our next speaker uh, comes to us from Boston University. This is Dr. Ann McKee, and she has one of the coolest jobs in the world. Please welcome Dr. McKee. Thank you. Well, hello. Um, it's nice to be here. I am going to present the research that we've done at Boston University and the VAs in Boston. I'm going to talk about a disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, as it pertains uh, to the football player. So I grew up in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is the, right outside of Green Bay. It's where the Green Bay Packers stay overnight before, if the visiting team stays overnight. And I grew up in a football family. Uh, my brothers played football, my dad played football, all my neighbors played football. And so even though I'm not from Texas, I do understand that football is much more than a sport. It is a culture, a way of life. And in many instances, like in this community, College Station, it's a, a, a source of pride and identity. And so that's why uh, I say with a little trepidation here, because of that gigantic stadium that I just saw, but I do have to say that there's a problem in football, and that problem is CTE. So what is this disease? It's a disease that we've known about for a long time. Back in the 1920s, it was first described in boxers. But over the last 10 years, it's been described in football players. And we've set up to understand this disease more completely. We set up a brain bank at Boston University. And we started identifying what makes this disease unique, what, what makes this disease unlike any other neurodegenerative disease of the nervous system. And first of all, there's a pattern of brain shrinkage that occurs. The brain actually gets smaller with this disease. And there's a toxic protein that develops in the brain called tau, T-A-U. And it builds up inside nerve cells uh, and the nerve cell processes and the other cells called astrocytes in the brain. And it builds up in a very, very specific pattern, a pattern that's not seen in any other disorder. And the two patterns that we see in this disease are, first of all, it occurs in little isolated hot spots. And those hot spots are always found at the base of the sulci. That's where the brain dives in. So it's the valleys of the brain. And you start to see these hot spots of tau pathology at the base of these sulci. That's one feature that's unique to this disorder. And the other feature is that it's around small blood vessels. So this is a perivascular deposition of tau two features that are not seen in any other disorder. I've had a lot of critics say that I define CTE by the presence of tau. That is categorically not true. There are a lot of diseases with tau, but this is a very unique uh, uh, pattern of tau. For me to say that this is a tau disease and you identify it by tau is like, is, is, is like saying that you identify a zebra because it has four legs. This is a, a very, very specific uh, disease. When you look at this disease compared to a normal brain, you can immediately see the areas of abnormality. It affects the frontal lobe, and so you get errors of judgment and concentration and, and an ability to think clearly. And it affects the medial temporal lobe, which is where uh, we have our memory uh, situated, and also things like uh, rage and emotionality. So that's why we get the symptoms we do in this disease. We know it's not a disease of aging. You can live to be 100, 110, 120, and you're not going to develop this disease. This is not accelerated aging, and it's not Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a disease that is characterized by the pro a deposition of a protein called beta amyloid. And in most instances, and in all early cases, in fact, in no cases under the age of 50 do we ever see that beta amyloid in the brains of uh, individuals with CTE. This is a disease that's associated with trauma. I can't say from this clinical pathological case series that it's caused by trauma. That is beyond the limits of my science. That's going to require a lot of epidemiological studies, prospective longitudinal studies, the ability to not only accurately measure head, head impacts during life, but also diagnose this disorder during life. And those are techniques we can't do right now. But I'm going to show you it's associated with trauma. Uh, the tau protein builds up in the brain in areas uh, that get the greatest concentration of traumatic forces. And we also know from looking at forensic pathology, individuals who die after acute trauma, that they very often have bruising in these same areas that we see uh, CTE lesions. So there's a lot of indirect evidence that this disease is caused by trauma. And that has prompted very important scientists like the head of the NINDS to conclude that this is a disease caused by trauma. Where, when it starts, what other factors are involved, we don't know. But this is a disease that's related to trauma. What we don't know, 
right now is how a, a concussion, or what we call subconcussion, leads to this chronic progressive neurodegenerative disease. That is something that's going to require a lot of research using animal models. It's going to require a lot of people getting together to really understand the pathogenesis of this disorder. And that right now is not clear. What we know is that the clinical presentation of this disease is, very, is variable, but a lot of times it's a behavioral change that you see, a mood, mood change like depression, but you also see cognitive loss, memory loss, and inability to think clearly. Uh, my colleague Bob Stern described two presentations, one in younger individuals about the age of 35 that presents as a behavioral disorder, often with depression, and another presentation that occurs generally later in life, usually in the 50s, that looks like Alzheimer's disease because it has a memory loss and executive dysfunction, but it, again, it is not Alzheimer's disease. We've had the opportunity over the last six or seven years to uh, look at the brains of 160 athletes, and 129 of them have been football players. We have diagnosed CTE in 102, which is a very high percentage. It doesn't reflect what's going on with living people. We don't know the incidence and prevalence of this disorder. We don't know the risks for uh, athletes in different sports. What, you know, what percentage will get this? We don't know that yet. That's going to require further study. But I think it is a very disturbing st statistic that out of 80 former uh, retired NFL players that we've had the opportunity to examine, we found 77 uh, with this disease. And so I'm just going to show you some examples of some of the players whose families have donated their brains to this study. You can see from looking at them that some of these are very young individuals, high school level football players, college level football players, in addition to professional players. We also have hockey players, boxers, and many other uh, athletes represented in this study. If you looked at the brains of those individuals, and this is what their brains would look like with the most mild disease at the top, just singular isolated areas of damage. And as the disease gets worse, it tends to spread to adjacent areas of the brain until it finally it involves uh, uh, widespread regions of the brain, including the areas for learning and memory and, uh, and emotionality, uh, and, then and then completely involves all of the brain in the very late stages. Uh, we divided the stages into four stages, and we found that the stage of CTE, that is the severity of CTE, directly significantly associated with exposure uh, uh, to the play of football. So the longer you play football, the higher your risk for this disease. I'll show you some examples. This is an 18-year-old who died after a concussion, and he had a single or a, just a few uh, isolated foci of this abnormality, an 18-year-old uh, former football and rugby player. And you can see just high magnification, uh, how it's around a blood vessel, and it's in the nerve cells and in, in all the nerve cell processes. Highly, highly abnormal for an 18-year-old who should have a, a completely pristine brain. We've seen it in older players. This is a 25-year-old who only played high school level sports. His, his brothers noticed a change in his personality beginning around age 19. He, be, he lost his, he became asocial. He sort of was a ne'er-do-well. Uh, formerly, he had been a very popular student. Uh, and he became also very depressed. And he uh, had multiple suicide attempts. He finally succeeded at the age of 25. And when we looked at his brain, we found uh, just a, a, an enormous amount of tau protein in his frontal cortex. Uh, really, I've never seen this density of pathology in such a young person before. And he also had it in his brain stem, so areas of the brain that control cognition and also depression. We've seen it in college-level players. This is Owen Thomas, who you may have heard of. He played uh, uh, football for the University of Pennsylvania, had played football since the age of nine, never had a concussion, was uh, team captain, unanimously uh, elected team captain, and he committed suicide. And what we found in his brain were these areas of abnormality in this 21-year-old's year old's brain. And again, this classic uh, distribution uh, diagnostic of CTE. We've seen it in other college football players. This is Michael Keck who played uh, for Missouri. He played uh, Division I college. He had post-concussion syndrome, syndrome while he was playing. He had memory lapses, difficulty sleeping, and debilitating headaches. At, that forced him to quit football. He, the, his symptoms continued to progress, even though he had stopped playing football. And eventually, he died uh, uh, from a staph infection at the age of 25. His wife wanted us to look at his brain because Michael had been worried about uh, his developing this disease. And you can see that uh, he did. He actually had 
quite a substantial amount of tau protein in his brain, even though he was only 25 as well, affecting frontal and temporal lobes, and no other disease in his brain, nothing else uh, that would have caused those symptoms. We've seen it in NFL players. You may know the story of Dave Duerson, who played 11 years for the Chicago Bears, very successful football player, and also very successful after he retired from football. Uh, he developed uh, cognitive symptoms the beginning around age 45, some behavioral changes, became very violent physically uh, uh, with his wife and family, had a number of uh, uh, poor business decisions. And he's the individual that texted his family that he wanted his brain donated to the NFL brain bank uh, before he took his own life by shooting himself in the chest. And you can see that in his brain, he has the classic pattern of CTE, only it's more severe than the others that I've shown you. This would actually correspond to stage 3 CTE. And no evidence of any other disease, no small strokes, no Lewy body disease, nothing else. The only disease Dave Duerson had was CTE. What does it look like in advanced players? Is an 80-year-old uh, former player, played 14 years. Uh, in the NFL. He died at the age of 80 with a very profound dementia. His brain was severely uh, shrunken at the time of death, uh, 860 grams. That's about the size of a one-year-old's brain. Uh, he, it, it was reduced by about half the size that it formerly was. So tremendous shrinkage of the brain. And then you can see the, the pattern of pathology really affecting the entire brain, uh, white matter, gray matter, and all the structures. No other disease in his brain either, just uh, CTE. So this is where we are now. We know that this disease exists. We're starting to understand the pathology. We're starting to understand the clinical symptoms that are correlated with this disease. But right now, our biggest problem is we can only identify this disease at autopsy. There's no way to identify it in living people. Lots of research groups all over the country are trying to do that with blood and CSF measures, also scans, special scans using a, a marker for tau. And hopefully, these in the next five years, we'll be able to diagnose this disease in living individuals. Right now, we have to really look at the acute injury and manage the acute injury, because that's the best way to prevent this disease. Uh, but we definitely need more research groups to understand how an acute injury evolves into a, a long-standing permanent injury. What are the unresolved questions? There are many, and uh, they are, this is just a few of them. Uh, we don't know the incidence and prevalence of CTE. Though that's going to require lots of epidemiological studies you with thousands and thousands of subjects. We need to know how to diagnose this disease, as I said before. We need animal models to understand the basic mechanisms. How does an acute traumatic event lead to a chronic neurodegeneration. We can't do that in human beings, but we can do that in animal models. And we need to know about genetics. Are there genetic susceptibilities? Are other factors important, like steroids and drug abuse and all that? I don't, they're not primary to this disease, but do they fuel the fire of this disease? That we don't know. And I think one of the main things that we need to do is figure out how to treat this disease. Because there are a lot of people out there that are worried that they have this disease. We need to give them hope that we have some remedies. Uh, maybe that's rehabilitation. Maybe that's treatment options. And we also need care, comprehensive care for these individuals. This isn't a disease that just affects the, the players, the athletes. It also affects their families. And we need a comprehensive care system uh, for them. I think there's an urgent need uh, to do more research on this disease, to understand all the things that we don't understand about this disease. Uh, we know that there are players out there that are very worried that they have this disease, they have symptoms of this disease, and we, I think, owe it to them, uh, because it's not only our athletes, it's also our military veterans, uh, uh, to find a, a way to give them hope. I want to thank all the people at Boston University and the VAs who contribute to this work. It takes a lot of effort from a lot of people. Uh, uh, to be able to bring this work uh, to you. And I also want to thank our funding sources, which is the NIH, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the DOD, uh, the Anlinger Foundation, and the WWE. So thank you very much. I know. So thank you Dr. very much, Dr. McKee. A very interesting and timely topic. We've got a, a couple of questions here, uh, one that's really interesting. Uh, all of them are interesting. Even though exposure to trauma stops when a player stops playing, does the disease continue to progress throughout the individual's lifetime? 
Yes, it does appear to progress. Uh, what, what, and we're not sure exactly how this happens. We think it's repetitive injury. So repetitive trauma on unrecovered injury. When you don't rest your concussion, when you don't come off the field, and you get repetitive injury on this unrecovered nervous system, we think that triggers a pathological cascade that then continues even though you stop playing football. So the typical story is retiring at the age of 30 or so, but then uh, age 35, age 40, they start to develop symptoms. And once those symptoms develop, up, they continue to progress as long as the person survives. So we had another question. You, you mentioned a, a point about uh, preventative, I think, uh, pre prevention. Is there any preventative treatment uh, for CTE for contact sport athletes, something that you can do prophylactically? No, right now there's no preventative treatment other than, uh, you know, taking care of those acute injuries as they occur. And in the case of football, limiting your head contacts, limiting those subconcussive injuries, those impacts that don't give rise to symptoms, but we still know occur. And, and those occur almost on, the, uh, on every single play of every game. That's, that's going to be the biggest uh, hurdle for football is eliminating all those very subtle uh, subconcussive con contact hits. Uh, Steve R. from the University of Maryland had, uh, has an interesting question. You mentioned the genetics. Uh, would you like to comment, because it's a big discussion right now, on the use of APOE genotype to deselect athletes from certain sports? Yeah, well, I can tell you that APOE4, that allele that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, uh, we don't see it overrepresented in our CTE group. We do see uh, an overrepresentation of E4E4, so homozygosity for that particular uh, 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 allele does seem to uh, be associated with CTE, but not in general, uh, just the APOE4. We're looking at that, though. We need more numbers, and we're also looking at some other genes, uh, tau genes, for example, and we're hopefully going to be able to identify susceptibility in the future. Fascinating talk, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank Please you. join me in thanking you. <laughs>